we believe that you can do less with more. Today I will be speaking with Principals Marlon and Mariati Blackwell of Marlon Blackwell Architects. Despite operating in Arkansas, which is a region where architecture can often be overlooked, the Blackwell's firm has amassed an important and a very impressive body of work that spans across a large array of different project types. The firm is ready to tackle any project that serves the common good, regardless of scale and budget, while applying the highest standard of design. The Office of Marlon Blackwell Architects received the 2016 Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Architecture and ranked number one in design as part of the Architect 50, a national survey of architecture firms. In 2011, Marlon Blackwell Architects was recognized as the firm of the year by Residential Architect magazine. The firm has earned an international design reputation through recognition of its work in many publications, including architectural design journals and books, and they have received more than 120 design awards, including state, regional, national, and international awards. So this was a real delight to be able to sit down and speak with both Marlon and Mariati. In this conversation, we discussed the practice's recent book, Radical Practice. The information to be able to get that will be in the information of this podcast. We talked about Arkansas and from my English naivete, if you like, um, I found this absolutely fascinating. And we discussed in depth about why Arkansas proved to be such a successful place for their architecture practice. And we also go into detail about working with clients, developing relationships, and also them working as a husband and wife team and the power that comes from that and also the challenges. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Marlon and Mariati Blackwell. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Marlon and Mariati, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. Yeah, thank how about you. yourself? I'm very well, thank you. So very excited to be speaking with you guys. And, 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 and you know, it's, it's really amazing because you guys have got an incredible portfolio of work. You've just completed and published a book um, radical practice which kind of documents um, a lot of your you know your, your stunning portfolio and it's a you know for me it's just fascinating to talk to an architecture practice um, because of the location in in Arkansas it's such an interesting part of the US and it's not normally the part of, of, of America that we think of when, we, when we're talking about you know you know, fantastic buildings being made. It's not always the first place that comes up. You know, New York and Los Angeles, these are the, the two, and San Francisco, these are the cities that tend to dominate. Um, and I was I was brought to your the attention of your work, actually, um, a little while ago um, through some other architects that I've been working with in, in Alabama and also in Arkansas. Um, and you know just kind of fell in love with what with what you guys were doing so you've got a, a very diverse portfolio of work um i know marlon you you still teach in academia mm -hmm. um and it's 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 a really fascinating um practice that you've developed so i guess the first question is why arkansas and how did the practice begin sure sure well uh, i'm originally from uh alabama from the South, but uh, I grew up in a military family. So I was born in Germany and lived in the Philippines and uh, Alabama, Florida, Montana, Colorado, all over. Uh, but uh, I had been living in uh, Boston and uh, had done uh, my graduate work with uh, Syracuse University in Florence, Italy for a year and had gotten out in the beginning of the 90s in the recession. Anyways, not a lot of work. So I started teaching at Syracuse University. Uh, but I had uh, a little bit of work under my belt. Uh, just been published in Architectural Record, Record Homes, and 
and you know, I wanted to really practice. I've been practicing for ten years in various firms, plus my own independent after hours studio. Uh, so, after a winter in Syracuse, I decided I want to come back south uh, and be with my people. So, so I had the intention of moving to North Carolina, but the school I wanted to teach at, get teach and practice, uh, North Carolina State wasn't looking at the time. Uh, so I brought it up interviewing in Arkansas at the University of Arkansas in Northwest Arkansas in the foothill of the Ozarks. There was a very uh, famous architect up there by the name of E. Fay Joe, who had just won the AIA gold medal. He was a protege of Frank Lloyd Wright. They'd done a, a chapel called Thorn Crown Chapel, quite, quite famous. Right. Uh, and so I went out and I, uh, they made an offer. They said, what would it take for you to come here? And I said, well, I'm really not an academic or, or a, an intellectual or a scholar. I'm, I'm really a practitioner who I believe I can teach. They said, well, if you'll come here, we will guarantee you commissions to start the practice. Uh, and so I went back to Syracuse so being there, and he said, you should go, <laughs> and came out, and they were true to their word. Um, I really fell in love with the landscape and with the spirit of change at the university and their willingness to support a faculty member who uh, really wanted to be engaged with creative activity. Mm-hmm. Amazing. And, and Mary Arty, when did you join the practice? Did you, were you involved in the in the founding? Somewhat, yes. Uh, I met Morlin when I was uh, a young architect in Miami. That's where I went to school. And after that, I was doing a little bit of internship there for several years. I think I ended up staying there about a little bit more than a decade. So while I was there, I met Morlin and we... He convinced me to marry him. <laughs> so after we got married, <laughs> to leave Malaysia, she had moved back to Malaysia. Yeah, I had moved back to Malaysia because uh, architecture, you know, was really exploding there. You were building infrastructures and high rises. You know, it's about the time where the new airport is being designed and constructed, and uh, the twin towers, the Petronas towers. Yeah, uh, by Cesar Pelli, yeah, all of those things. So I was like, wow, time to go. Very exciting. So I went over there. But well, I guess we must have liked each other enough that uh, to think that we should be together because we were never in the same place ever uh, throughout the four years that we were friends. So um, we started to get married. Marlon came to Malaysia. We had a Malaysian wedding. It was great. And after that, I thought, okay, well, I guess we're going to Arkansas just for a year or two, right? Because this is your... <laughs> We're there because of his teaching position at the University mm-hmm. of Arkansas, and then maybe start a small practice, but not intended to be a full-time or long-time, like, forever place. At least in my mind, I thought we'll probably end up in California. <laughs> yeah. But we're still here. So, yeah, I, you know, Morlin, of course, um, was there, I think, three years before I joined you in Arkansas, Morlin? About three years, I think? Yeah. Yeah, so he already were doing small practice, like a sole proprietor type of business. Uh, but I was helping him for any work that he has at night and things like that. But when he had enough of a, you know, bulk of the work where he needs somebody full time, that's when I, I joined him. So I was sort of the, maybe not the original founder in the initial years, like a sole proprietor situation, mm-hmm. but then... I've joined him ever since. So. Yeah, we, I started basically in Fayetteville in 1992, and by, uh, I'd say, uh, 2000, Nati had been already helping, working in other firms as well, but helping mm-hmm. be transition to digital. And, you know, we, were, we would mm-hmm. draw, I would draw by hand on a project, and she would draw on her little orange tangerine Mac. And uh, <laughs> this, this tower house that we were doing, and I was drawing Honey House, and uh, and then in 2000, I, I think I had an opportunity to go teach at MIT for a semester, and she was pregnant with our second child, and basically said, "You need to move out of your office. We need that as another bedroom, for, and open up an office on the square." So that's what we did, and then with that in mind, she joined us just for the initially just for the flexibility to kind of, kind of go with you know, mm-hmm. children and stuff, but then also to help run a practice because I, I was realizing that I really wanted to move away from small residential and really get into commercial public work 
institutional work, work that I thought could make a, a greater impact. So it really was deviating from the original plan, which was to be the noble savage doing two or three uh, uh, residential projects, building up a body of work over 30 years uh, and yeah. you know, being really hip and cool doing residential. I, I just kind of uh, really felt like I really wanted to do something more impactful. So kind of mm -hmm. did some residential, but moved away from that move. We yeah, got a chance to do a small public library, a um, golf clubhouse. And so these were new commissions that demanded that uh, we have a, uh, a staff. So it was Ati and I originally uh, in a little office on the square, town square. Um, and then we started taking on some people to do these larger projects. Uh, yeah. And the office sort of just sort of took off from there uh, for about, say, eight, nine years. We were doing a variety of work, small, but a variety of work. And uh, we got a national project at the Indianapolis mm -hmm. Museum of Art to do uh, the Ruth Lilly uh, pavilion for the new 100 acre art and nature park in Indianapolis. Things were going great. Also, doing teaching at Arkansas and guest teaching other places like Washington University of St. Louis. Yeah, I think Molin was um, also building an academic career at the same time in parallel with when we are studying our business and scaling mm -hmm. it to a point where. We're not just going to do little, you know, houses uh, anymore. And I also wanted it to be much more of a professional profession. I didn't want it to yeah. be working from home. And I think I kind of like give him the encouragement and the understanding that we have the capacity to do it. Because he was worried that, well, I'm teaching. I won't have time to draw and, you know, manage a, an office. And I was like, well, that's what I do. Or I'm project architect in another firm like now that we have yeah. our own family we need the flexibility but i can do the things that i used to do in another firm but within our office so i didn't have a lot of fear in terms of scaling or taking on more because you know i've seen that happen in my workplace and knowing that i can focus on that while he's also uh building that parallel uh, practice, um teaching mm -hmm. Uh, academic side and then together we can manage uh, the design and the you know construction documentation but at the same time I am at the office and I am able to work while he's absent for example teaching so yeah. I think it, it kind of we fill each other's gap yeah so we're teaching and, yeah. and, and practicing and, and lecturing doing I mean, things are going great and then 2008 hits uh, our, our business model primarily was uh, no business cards. We don't collaborate. We don't form teams. We don't do competitions. We don't do RFQs. We just do whatever comes through the door. Sort of patterned that after Faye Jones, who was a friend and mentor, um, who had uh, unfortunately passed away in 2004. But he had, uh, he had given me some great advice. I said, how did you maintain over 60 years such an incredible body, inconsistent body of work? Um, and he said, uh, and I asked, by the way, this very same question of Lynn Merkin. Basically, they both said the same thing. He said, well, that's simple. You don't start a practice. Uh, or, or excuse me, they said, you start a practice the way you want to end it. Mm -hmm. And he said, you don't wake up at 50 and decide to do good work. You have to start out with that mind and take the narrow path, the less straight path. Uh, to arrive at that. Uh, and so that's really what we set out to do. Yeah. The, the combination of teaching and practicing help allow for that. Same time, uh, we are growing. We're at nearly 10 people by that time. And then uh, the Great Recession hits. And, you know, people quit walking through the door, the phone stopped ringing. Uh, projects went on hold and we are in a kind of uh, I would what I would call the death spiral you know in the plane and the uh, you know you're you know the, the ground is getting closer and it was like what mm -hmm. do we do and Ati and I we were really at a loss we were having to lay off good people uh, we, we just we were didn't know what to do and we were inspired somewhat by uh, 
by uh, Obama and some idea of stimulus, stimulus packages and the, uh, the, the shovel ready projects and things like that. that get going. And I, I just came to the conclusion we said, you know, we have to change our business model. Um, right. We're going to have to give ourselves a stimulus. Uh, and we, we, across the street was the local banker, John Lewis, who had taken an interest in us and had helped us. We, uh, you know, established like a credit line. You know, when we were on our first big commission, he came across the street and said, I heard you just got a, a big clubhouse project for Mr. Mr. Tyson, CEO of Tyson Foods. Yeah, how'd you hear that? He goes, it's a small town. And he said, you're going you're, you're to need a staff and you're going to need to pay that staff. They're not always going to pay you in time. So it's a good credit line. Fortunately, Ati and I had worked really hard for years to establish good credit. Yeah. So he gave us a significant credit line to help that. So we went back. We never really used it, but with the recession, we went back to it and said, we want to give ourselves a stimulus of about $15,000. And we're going to hire a graphic designer. We're going to do you know, a new web page, a uh, new portfolio, new RP packages, all of these things that we swore we'd never really do and put ourselves out there. Because a good friend of mine, a really great architect, uh, Vincent James, told me, he said, you know, architects know who you are, Marlon. But clients do not. And uh, that's the thing you're going to have to struggle with. And we also wanted, uh, so in doing that, we felt like we needed to team up. We needed to do our piece. Uh, and we tried it initially, and now we're into 2009, laying off people or reassigning people, or, you know, getting jobs elsewhere. Uh, we wanted to do schoolwork, uh, institutional public work, but you couldn't get into that because it's locked up through the good old boy system. In the in where we yeah. live in the south, but by a, a, a weird chance, a athletic director for our high school had loved the library that we did in Century, Arkansas, the small library that won a national award, and invited me in, and basically told me they were looking to do a new high school, a big high school, a hundred million dollar high school, and he said, "How would you like to do that school?" And I, my mouth fell open. What are you talking about? And so I said, we have never done any school. We're, we're, we're a firm of about five people. <laughs> and he goes, well, I'm going to help you form a team. And you're going to, we're going to create this team. And you're going to be the local guy. But you're, you're going to be the design. Anyways, long story short, we formed a team in one department. And we've got together with a really great educational architect in Kansas City, really good educational architect in Northwest Arkansas. And we formed this team and got this. And that helped us get through the recession. We also then got the new architecture school at Arkansas. So a couple of these larger commissions that helped uh, helped us demonstrate that we could scale up. Uh, you know, right. moving from this residential scale to the small commercial, small institution, and scale up and not lose anything proved that we were onto something, at least in terms of our language mm -hmm. and vocabulary. So, so, so it was really the the kind of two thousand and eight um, economic contraction that stimulated this kind of pivot in the business and yeah. and had you kind of start marketing really and kind of putting yourself out there and going out after after right. um, lots of other work right and it's in interesting you, you mentioned there um glenn murcott and because because his business model is very interesting obviously he works as a, a sort of sole practitioner right and he's made a lot of effort and energy to oh. not be beholden to the the usual pressures of architectural practice so he works you know in a, in a solitary manner rarely would work for commercial or, or professional developers or anybody like that yeah. and his clients you know famously have to wait five years before they can yeah. they can they can work yeah. with him well he, 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 yeah. he's unique and i i admire it he's a model uh, but it's not the model we can fo follow religiously sure yeah. yeah, and I also didn't want to follow the same quaint model when you're from a small town, you do small things and your precious small things get recognized and it's very few and far between. Like, I didn't want to be that. I feel like just because we are in, a, in the middle of America in a place where there was an incredible, for, you know, several Fortune 500 companies that are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, making a project possible, for example, like the community is supporting this quality type project so um i you know I, I think i think together we were 
pushing this narrative away from, in a way like Faye Jones is our model, but at the same time is 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 trying to get away from that in a way that it is still about the craft of architecture, but in terms of business, we want to be, you know, uh, competitive with other firms mm -hmm. that are practicing in the centers, you know, other uh, other city centers like Boston or New York or Los Angeles, and uh, we didn't feel in any way wanted to limit ourselves, you know, like that we can do cute little quaint things for, mm -hmm. you know, people in the middle only, like, you know, I, I well, feel like, yeah. Yeah, but I, but I think too, because of where we were with the Tyson, Walmart, the headquarters of all of this here, we were getting some opportunity to do some work and, and do work in places where you'd least expect to find this level of yes. architecture. We were yeah. on the cover of Architectural Record in February 2001 with our Keenan Tower House, but it was an issue about architects operating outside the centers of fashion. And that has become, in some ways, our brand at one level, both yeah. a blessing and a curse, uh, because we do have aspirations and we want, you know, we are competing now with, uh, you know, some, you know, all the the big names, but we're also very committed to working in our place, right? We, we like to say the mm -hmm. work we make is in our place, uh, of our place, and for our place, uh, and in the places we often work. So we're now doing work in Detroit, uh, Houston, Dallas, mm -hmm. uh, even Central Africa, where we're now working with the state wow. on embassy work. So we, we've really... Uh, committed. I think the thing I should also say, uh, in fairness about P, is collaborating on the work and doing the work together. But I also made another important decision in 2008, which was essentially to turn the financial aspect of the firm over to her. I used to do invoicing and, you know, with all this stuff, you know, and I just got to the point where I couldn't. And I just, she just has a, she's more entrepreneurial and she has mm -hmm. a better business mind than I do. I recognize that. So I just sort of, I trust her and I just sort of say here and, you know, she knows when to come to me, but I sort of put her in charge of that and we'll obviously discuss things, but I think her taking the lead has also freed me up in some ways to be a little bit more of a risk taker uh, and, and really focus on the work uh, as well yeah. uh, and developing um, a vocabulary uh, that we can call our own in some way. It's, uh, it's been, uh, I can't put that uh, uh, mm. fully into words how important it has been for the development. So, so, so a real start of kind of division of roles there, where one of you was kind of starting to focus more on the managing partner roles, the business aspects of it, the financial management of the company, and then there was a creative leader if you like as well that was kind of starting to emerge yeah yes yeah now. yes i think in terms of a primary role you know uh i'm on the other hand i also during this time are the project managers and the project architect of projects that we are doing in addition to my role as the finance person you know or the person that's running the office making decision in regards to business stuff um uh but also at the same time, I have developed this sort of side uh, specialty while I was in Miami and in Malaysia, which is like the architectural interior side that the, right. because of the my internship that I have always kind of find myself working while I was in Miami as well as Malaysia, that whole aspect of not only architecture, but like, you know, hospitality and all of that stuff that's fully integrated. It's still designed, but involve a lot more tactile stuff like textile and furniture and fixtures and things like that. And so it has become something that I realized I enjoyed. And, and you know, as the office get and the project get bigger, there's a larger component of that. Like someone needs to be the one you know, heading that interior materials and furniture and furnishing for some of our project and things like that. So that I've become that certified, you know, director of interiors as well during yeah, this which, time in order to further define our different roles. Right. So more as an academic and a 
design leader and all that while I the finance and um, managing the firm as well as the interior side of architecture as well. Well, you know, I still not leaving the job of doing integration as an architect. But, but I should add with our team. Yeah. But I should add out that that also mm -hmm. creates another revenue stream yes. for our practice too. But you're now mm -hmm. now we we built up some credibility with clients and stuff that we can do the mm -hmm. interiors of I mean we getting ranked in the top you know, yeah, we're, we're also, yes. and so, but that's taken a while, but that's been something that's been very purposeful. Uh, and that we, we have, a, so we've kind of expanded our presence, uh, on, yeah. on the scene, you know, very, very much like Rick Joy, for example, you've seen him being awarded as, you know, best interior designer of the year by contract magazine or interior design magazine. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, like sometimes that, that flow of the walk between architecture and interiors and furniture and furnishings even is so much a part of the practice now. I mean, not all of our project involve the furniture and furnishings part, but certainly certain project type does require us to get into that. And we don't like to hire a separate consultant if we can, and we right. can do them in-house. So. Well, it's, it's not uncommon these days as well that people spend more money on the interiors than they do on the architecture. Yeah, I know. Boy, <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> so, so, so uh, again, it's, it's really interesting, actually, that the the kind of choice to to remain in Arkansas and and build a practice from from there. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about some of the advantages that being located in Arkansas, in Arkansas sure. has allowed? And, and I'm, I'm guessing, you know, I'm, I'm an ignorant Englishman who hasn't been to the, the center of, of the U.S. before. And I'm assuming I've, I've got this romantic ideal that, that, that there's like a lot less planning regulations and you can yes. well, more scope was, for creativity. To some extent. Yeah, well, you, you know, need to come visit us and we can show you around yeah. for sure. Yeah, well... <laughs> It is a bit of a geographical oddity where most of our projects are about 15 to 20 minutes away. Um, I right. think one of the advantages, yeah, obviously it's great. We can get things built and built quickly. I had been working in Boston, but like I said before, I came here. It would take a year, a year and a half to get a building permit. I could get one in a week here. Uh, if I'm building out in the county, I don't really even need one. You know, so it's it's you know, different, obviously, with these public buildings and stuff that we're doing in school, sure. that's very different. But it is somewhat more streamlined. You are more, people are more, uh, the government entities are, while they may have their policy stuff, you know who you're dealing with, you get out ahead of it. You do a lot of front-end work uh, in City Hall, uh, and things just seem to happen in a more streamlined way. Uh, so I think that's really helpful. I think the other thing is just your quality of life. You know, the school is nearby. The You know, it's like living in New York and everything you need is like within a block or two. Well, I'm the same way. Everything I need is within five minutes. You know, I go to, go to the university to teach or go downtown to the office. Uh, so I'm, I'm guess I get two hours plus more productive work time instead. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that well, others, yeah, they may work on a train or whatever, but I, I feel like, hey, I'm getting a lot. My days are very productive. It's great as well. Plus, the, the standard of living, quality of living, high, and, and it's not it's expensive, right? places so. and, and and has that been advan an advantage then the kind of lower overhead costs of being and, and and certainly if you're if you're now kind of um competing for work out of the state and yeah. up against you know you, you, are you able to kind of be a lot more competitive with your pricing or do you keep your pricing up up with the other yeah it's we, i think our pricing a, might be about the same with others but i think that we can do more with that like we don't worry so much yeah. about doing six different iteration or like uh you know more options so that the clients can see our design development for example so that there's less of a control aspect of like do not exceed this hours yeah. of this project or we would not make a profit so that kind of stuff i think it's less pressure on us so the fee may or may not be less than others, but I think we are about the same if you compare it with other national firms. 
Um, but in terms of what we can do for that fee within ourselves for our own research or iteration, and certainly the clients can really see the difference when they work with us because they were like, wow, you're showing me this, you, you're doing more options. It's like, and because we don't worry so much about like our spent, you know, because yeah. it's, yeah, I think, it's I somewhat mean, figured. Yeah. It's always concerned, but we've never been bean counters. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I, because, you know, your name is going on the thing. It's so our our attitude, one of the principles we have is whatever it takes, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're all in, right? And uh, I think that's, uh, that's done well for us. The, the clients understand that, you know, NBA, they're going to be responsive. They're going to, they're going to be there. Uh, you know, they're not about pointing fingers. They're about the project and the project is larger than everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, and we're, getting people to buy into that process, into the project and just being the ultimate goal, that realization. Right? And yeah. and by doing that, we can do more with less. And I, I think... One thing I do want to say when you ask about, about, you know, building a practice in a small place, I feel like, okay, first of all, our small place is not without incredible economy because of, our, like I mentioned, the companies that make their headquarters here, like Walmart and Tyson and you know, the wall, you know, all of those people uh, and those companies. But being in a smaller place, like within a short period of time, you get to know people in your community, start doing work and people talk. And, you know, you know, before you know it, you start knowing the who's who of the town that may be able to recommend you for a project. And then to the next project is sort of like the compound um you know, uh, base of your potential client happens mm. quite quick, quickly. Um, I feel like that's that's part of the, you know, the early success of our work is that the community, you know, embrace us a lot sooner than if we were, I would imagine, in a place like LA or New York. If you don't, if you just landed there not knowing anyone, you have to build up that, that base, right? Like people that you know and that kind of stuff. And here it's a lot easier but, to but do Ati, that. But don't you, I, I have a different memory, sorry. It took 10 years to get a project of any scale. I was here from 1992 until 2002 before we got even the library going, before we got the blessings we what I call the thin crust of people that would say, well, I, oh, I, we can I know, entrust but, you with something. I didn't but just I don't know, like, step off but the yeah, plane but, and people like, oh, he's here. But, you know, it, it, it didn't work. I don't, but I'm not sure that it'll be any, sh well, maybe you're right. Maybe it's not any shorter elsewhere, but I don't know. I feel no, like there's, there's no, there's no, you know, we know there's no profit in their own land. I mean, you know, mm. we, we have had to fight. We still have to fight with other firms locally here to do stuff. And we're like, why are we still having to compete with these folks? You know, it's like our track record mm -hmm. to speak for itself. But we run into this problem, too, even though we are known as kind of like the MacGyvers of architecture. You know, we give us a paper clip and we can do something with it. Um, you know, we believe that you can do less with more. You know, we believe in the economy of means, using an economy of means for a maximum of meaning. Uh, well, that's great. And we're very resourceful and so forth, but a lot of folks look at our work and they go, "Oh, well, we could never afford that, even if it is simple and you know falls within the market or below." Uh, and then they look yeah. at the work and then they might say, "Oh, but our project really doesn't deserve." So it's almost like the aspirations where we live too. While yes, with some in that thin crust are quite high, with others mm -hmm. they are not, and that's why we stay away from developers and things of. Uh, for the most part, uh, here really low aspiration work because uh, you know we're all running out of run. Life is short, and uh, so we have to align ourselves with institutions mm -hmm. for profit and not for profit uh, that want to be impactful in the work that they generate as well so they need yeah. partners for that and that's how we've begun to so we still take what comes through and with our friends as i was saying we have friends now that we're like we're, we're probably going to do a kennel dog and cat that's for a friend of ours who's done seven small projects but we're we're still we're doing 
little things in the Delta, the poorest parts of the country, in the Mississippi and Arkansas Delta. We believe that's important work, but we also believe in this higher level work of schools, uh, healthcare, uh, hospitality, doing a, a hotel now in Boston across the part of the business. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're trying to keep that work diverse, tied to the place, but also standing expanding our boundaries and it's it's actually it's in some ways more work to try to maintain work here in our place than it is elsewhere did you find that there was very different attitudes perhaps to a more contemporary style of architecture based where you where you are as opposed to say somewhere like los angeles or new york yeah where there's kind of the th thriving all these, these places that are kind of constantly screaming and shouting to change and push the, the right. envelope out, if you like. Well, you know, fortunately, we had E. Faye Jones. We had Warren Seagrace and other mid-century modern architects that we are standing on their shoulders. So there is a diverse architectural, uh, ooh, let's say, uh, post-war in Northwest Ar Arkansas, some traditions of that. So... It is somewhat embraced, not everyone, but it, it is. We are in a process of cultural uh, transformation that is happening in Northwest Arkansas around well-being, healthcare, and uh, culture, and just a host of things. Because you know Walmart is in direct competition now with Amazon, and so they have thrown their lot in with the rural, Amazon more with the urban, and they are trying to bring talent. Here, so they're really up in the game here, raising the bar. We're happy to be part of that. So uh, I don't think so. I don't, you know, when it comes to like the parametric or what, you know, we're, we're, we're having to build with the skill sets that we have available to us here. Right. So that's why, you know, we're still, we still, we work with boxes, you know. We're well, I really do don't so. think, I, I... I think more than anything is that our, comp uh, our area doesn't really have a very strong uh, historical tradition fabric tradition like right. like New Orleans for example you yeah. know or Boston where a lot of masonry has a certain look you know that you kind of like most people know and they want that houses has to look like from Cape Cod like white siding Martha Stewart kind of situation like there is no consistent language yet where we are our tradition so i think people are a lot more open to modern right. work because they they know that oh wow, that's different that's and it feels good inside yeah. like so they didn't know that they needed to have uh, i mean some people still do but they don't they're not pushing back so much you know to have something different uh mm -hmm. that they haven't seen before or not similar but even though our work reference a lot of the you know, the vernacular uh, or that we find around. Yeah, sure. the, the clients here, I mean, a, a lot of our initial clients, they'd never even worked with an architect. Uh, and they didn't really know what they wanted, but they knew what they didn't want, which is what everybody else had. And so mm -hmm. that's a great place to be, great place to start, right, with a client. And, and we still ha have that a lot. It's like, I'm not really sure what I want. And we don't even talk about it. We just talk about what it does. You know, and, and how it actually is manifested, it seems to be less of a concern as long as we can meet the budgets and, and it performs well, both uh, socially and environmentally and, and, and economically, you know, and, and if it's, it's very useful and functional, then they're, they're pretty, pretty cool with that. If you've ever read uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, Self Reliance, it's a short read, right. but it really encapsulates the culture. Of, uh, of pragmatism that we operate in in Northwest Arkansas, hard scrabble, traditionally poor area that has come into some through their engine ingenuity and business have come into some wealth. Uh, but that pragmatism lives on. There is no crazy money where we are at, even though you know six or seven of the wealthiest people in the world live here. Uh, there's no crazy money. So there's pragmatism we feed off of. It feeds our work but it feeds the sensibility uh, of, the, of, of how we approach the business as well as the design. 
And and in, and in terms of um, there, there not being kind of masses of of kind of insane wealth like you get in these kind of pools on the on the east and west coasts, um, as an as an architect practice, what what did you find was the keys to maintaining you know financial success or keeping your head above of wa- above water and maintaining maintaining profits? Whether was there a particular niche or a particular type of, of sector that you could always depend on or was it more a strategy of being having a diverse portfolio that yeah i i, I think kind of, if i can i'll i'm gonna chime in a little bit on that Ati, and then you should chime in but i uh one of the things that glenn Merkett and ife jones also told me is that there is no bread and butter in a really mm-hmm. good architectural practice he said don't go there you don't need a sunglass hut account and we we've, we've purposely not done that. It, again, it's the road less traveled because right. I don't want to be the apologist to say, oh, when we get a really good project, we'll do great work. Well, that doesn't happen. You have to do great work for everything, whether it's a carport, you know, or an airport. <laughs> you know, it's it's important that you give the hundred and ten percent. So that attitude, I think, has uh, has uh, you know been really informative. So we. And that's, man, you know, that has caused us to call ourselves, you know, not for profit, you know, because we, we had many, there's been many years where it's been really challenging, you know, what we call the roller coaster. And, uh, you right. know, and you have those dreams of getting off the roller coaster onto the gravy train, right? Uh, but, and then just as you step off the roller coaster, you get on the gravy train, the roller coaster comes by and saps you up again and up you go and down you go. And, you know, it's only in the last three or four years where I think we've begun uh, this larger scale work has begun to take hold and people are entrusting us. Uh, and we've been more clever about how we team uh, with other firms. Uh, I think we, we we are more sophisticated in how we use our time. We're really uh, actually a lot quicker. Talent works quickly. That's something that, you know, very often is not taught in school. They like to think that you know, it's, you know, the slow, you know, the thinker sitting there forever and then producing very little. Uh, and somehow that is precious. Uh, our attitude in the office, talent looks quick. Uh, and so we, we're, we're all about not missing deadlines and all of that. So we're very efficient in that regard. And I think that helps us on our bottom line. I know you can say more. Well, yeah. I'll approach it from a standpoint of finance and business aspect. We grew uh, very cautiously, so we're always aware of like you know the kind of work, the the size of work, the size of fees. Uh, so that's why we started with two people, to four people, to six people, to ten people. So like we're not trying to push it like a, a, a you know a, like to produce in order to become big. So we uh, we grew in proportion to the kind of work that we can get. And uh, and finally, we get here, which is I imagine this is similar size office for a lot of our larger competitors. And you know, we are able to do that. I feel like because of the uh, project how many, budget. How many people are you now? We're now 27, 28 oh. around there. Yeah. Um, um, so you know, the kind of work that we pursue now, uh, of course, a variation. We can do. Uh, houses of a certain size, for example, because it, it, it helped keep the design in the company agile. At the same time, we have, you know, a $30 million office building or a $300 million project in another country mm-hmm. for em- our embassy work, for example. So we have a variety of work, but we are always constantly aware of the what that, you know, the financial aspect of what it requires to carry 28 people and right. never be over our head and only pursue, be strategic in the kind of uh, project that we pursue. So, you know, it has to balance between what we want us as a design practice to, to, to continue doing, but at the same time, also allowing ourselves to kind of like consider the financial aspect of, is that something that we can, 
you know, considerably do that. Of course, we don't always go for bigger projects because we have a several variety. We have community work that are almost an, uh, a pro bono type of situation that we're doing all the time because it's important to our office. But we do that into, into our mission as well. But we do that knowing that we can balance, you know, the larger scale project with the smaller stuff, but always with a background of uh, how we can handle that uh, financially. So. What 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 kind of um, financial metrics do you pay attention to, and kind of make sure that you're, you know, kind of yeah. on target? Okay, uh, of course we work with our accountants, and in house we have a projection. So uh, mm-hmm. we look at our past, and then we can see how we can project for the next year. So of course every year we want to do at least more than what you did last year, and okay. then and then try to make sure that it can achieve those goals. So like if you have a $15 million target last year and this year, let's think what you want your growth to be and try to get that. And while you're at it, you try to manage your overhead costs and any kind of research. So, you know, the things that are that you can't control are like competition and, and effort to get new work. Like, you, you know, you still have to pursue that, but you have to keep control of those kind of stuff. Uh, one of our larger uh, cost items are IT and, and, and softwares and those kind of thing in addition to uh, salaries, but uh, those are one of the things that is required now. Like if you don't renew our servers, for example, or our software now it's all on um, subscription, you know, those could become like a cost overrun that you can't manage. So we, we try to do that, you know, we try to project um, and make correction like twice a year, for example, like, okay, we had projected for the whole year, but in the middle of the year, we look back to see if we need to cut or pursue more things in order to kind of more more or less in line. You can you can only plan, but you can't really but it, uh, assure that you can hit your target or more target or under target, you know, but, uh, but you know, being aware of that at all times, uh, is is I think one of the biggest things, and I'm still again like you know starting from two people, for example, to now where we are. It's always a constant awareness so that we don't fall below, because it's it's very easy, like especially yeah. since um, really there's just the two of us like that has carried the financial burden in a way that, but at the same time you want to make sure that you know everyone's awarded well, compensated well, and happy doing good work and, and you, you, all those things so so yeah it's you know like but i think all business particularly all architectural business go into the same well uh, it, it, yeah situation it, that we do yeah it's, we're no different and i i think it's because we trying to diversify to continue to diversify mm. that's I, that's what i watched uh, in the the last recession all these firms that tank that we're not diversified, and uh, we just don't want to put ourselves in this situation. We may do one of everything, <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, you know I, I, I just, you know, just give us the opportunity. That's that's, you know, invite us to dinner, and then occasionally let us sit at the table and partake. Uh, but it is true we're having to be uh, much more self-conscious about projects that we take. In terms of the time that they take, you know, a small five million dollar project can often take the same amount of time as a, a fifty million dollar project. And, you know, it's just like, do we pursue this or not? You know, like, uh, we we our track record with RFPs and stuff is pretty miserable. To say, uh, I don't know, uh, three and thirty. <laughs> yeah. uh, right. It, it, we don't get work unless we have it in, unless we know somebody. Somebody yeah. knows us. It's just we're we're doing right now. We are about to take on market director. Never thought we would do it. We're we're having to compete at such a with such a high level of other offices that we we have to do a better job of when we're invited in to actually get us over the finish line. So we're looking at how we can do that. Uh, you know, we're looking at how we can. Get IT to be something that's maybe less in-house and more out-of-house. 
and jar uh, more efficient and make sure that we're in the market relative to the positions. Uh, we're not mm -hmm. going to be the highest, but we're not going to be the lowest. Safe. When, 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 when do you know when to say, or how do you know when to say no to a project? Um, well, you will know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's sort of like you you start to get this feeling, and then everything gets confirmed. I, I think you know? it's 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 you qualify the client, and if if it keeps coming back in a, as a as a kind of expedient, low aspiration kind of project, you know the message there is we're not the best fit for that. Um, and uh, you know, I, I like to tell folks there are no bad projects. Mm -hmm. So, qualifying, and we've made some mistakes. I mean, read about it. Uh, you know, not getting the right client, but you know, you have to trust and, and hope for the best. It, everything's relational, um, but sometimes it just doesn't feel good. And I, uh, you know, we I, so we we generally stay away from developers, but not exclusively. Right. We're working with a great developer right now in Boston. It just depends on the project, depends on the context and the situation. Uh, so it, right now it's still a bit more instinctual. We don't have mm -hmm. metrics to say, oh, we can't work that. But uh, but I, I think we are getting to the point where do we really need to pursue this? We're, we're I, I personally am. The, the thing that's hard to say no to is Yeah. And, Sure. We have started saying no on residential work. We've really pulled back on that. It's just, it's just where we're located is not the best, uh, best type of project. Yeah. So I, 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 I really see uh, a sweet spot for us is you know, perhaps between the, uh, you know, the, the ten and sixty, seventy million dollar project or something. Somewhere, but but we'll we'll do smaller things because if it can make an impact in the community and still you know uh, celebrate design and the culture of design, mm -hmm. uh, we're, you know you can get us at hello there sometimes. Well, one um, final question to to wrap up here. Um, obviously, it's not uncommon to see husband and wife teams running architecture practices what would you say are some of the challenges of working together and also some of the advantages that being you know being so close as a, as a leadership and as a partnership bring and it's no it's no it's a because it's a totally unique you know type of relationship and you know how do you know when to 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 not talk shop how does it <laughs> We're working on that. <laughs> neither, of our, neither of our children want to be architects. I just asked our daughter, even, why? Because you guys just argue all the time and bring it home. You know? <laughs> uh, but we, uh, I think it's uh, it's taken us a while um, to learn how to work together. I think mm -hmm. to learn to trust, uh, to, you know, I know for Hati to find that uh, her role since I, we're kind of ahead on this started, you know, and then she's coming in, um, and you know, being able to make the commitment when uh, she was, I think, in many ways, the primary caregiver, of the young family, and that's the, yeah, and that now has sort of changed, and you know, but I think more importantly is to have a partner. I always know that she has the best interest of of us and of the firm together in mind and that's a very comforting thing i don't have to worry about that i think we've learned how to complement each other um the the uh, role in the interiors of mine uh in the exterior you know it's not that defined by any means uh, yeah, architect. And, sure. uh, while i'm not at quote unquote interior design i know what interior design is interior architecture but there's something i'm noticing about the work lately uh is that it becomes more and more resonant uh, our roles uh, in in the project is more evidence, uh, and I I think that's just through sheer tenacity and persistence to, you know, agree mostly. But when we disagree, we do disagree, and we're not always delicate about it. And sometimes we do it in front of us. I hate that, 
Um, but we don't we don't walk away. You know, we don't hold the grudge. Mm. Uh, we work through it. I think that's what's kept our marriage intact for thirty years. What kept this uh, this uh, this business uh, uh, possibility or experiment or whatever uh, intact as well. So uh, we're in it together, and we're partners, and we disagree. We're not always in agreement, but we're working on how to better uh, present our disagreements and our agreements. I should say. Yeah, yeah. And if I if I have to say about the negative is like you tend to carry that home. Like if you have, yeah. You know, worry about business or like, oh, we're gonna get paid. You know, like in the beginning, you know, like that, like in time before our next payroll, whatever it is. Like then you start to bring that worry home, which if you work another firm, you don't have to do that. Like you know, and then it becomes sort of an issue that you really don't want to, you know, be negative about when you're at home trying to relax. Um, yeah, and the positive is sort of like. You know, you're already working on that relationship at home. Like we kind of mm -hmm. trust, have a level of trust with this person. So in a way, like you have already a built-in trust about an understanding, not only when it comes to design or trajectory of the firm, where the business wants to go, business decision. Like I think there's a, a lot of trust there, even though we don't, I would say 50% of the time we don't agree on the that uh, much? on set wow, but it... <laughs> like right away until we could come to like oh yeah i think actually a little bit of discussion or maybe a few more yell yelling at each other <laughs> like we actually like come to a conclusion that's a good idea or you know like mm -hmm. like sort of a give and take but um lots of give and take i think a lot of give and take but i think uh i feel that because we already have that relationship at home, you don't have to worry so much about offending someone else. Like if your other partner said, you know, like that boundary of how you communicate with each other or even personality trait, you know, like, like that's already been, you know, you're married to each other. So like clearly you kind of are okay with each other's personality type, you know, either you like it or not. But like, I think that's other, yeah, so that makes it a little bit easier, I think. Uh, if other than you know, if you have other partners, then you may at some point like worry about those the little things that could end up being a larger things. Like I can't really stand this person, or that person can't really stand me, or kind of thing that it's like shouldn't be any any issue when you're just doing work. But um, yeah, so some of those things I think is the benefit of knowing each other on the level that's. A little bit more than just your work colleague. So, love it, love it. Well, I think that's the perfect place to to conclude yeah. the conversation today. Absolutely, um, to be continued. Marlon, Mary, <laughs> thank you so much. I've, I've actually have loads more that I would like to talk to you about. But I've, I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you. Um, this evening and I do hope that we get to get the chance to do it again and I do have a plan to come to Arkansas in the not too distant future. You so. do, well then you, you'll, you'll definitely have to come yeah. see us. Yes, we'll, we we'll show you around for We sure. could talk about bear wrestling, Bible selling and uh, barbecue. <laughs> Chicken, you know, Perfect. anything. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, guys, for, for, for your insights and your expertise and just the you know, beautiful work that you've been producing thank and you. and sharing um, some of the stories behind the, the creation of that. Thank you, Ron. Thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. Have a good one. Enjoy the rest bye. of your evening. Yeah. Good night. Bye. Good evening. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.